get started. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you all uh, here to Norwalk. And I'd like to thank the members of the TRG for agreeing to participate in this process. Um, Russ, for some reason, uh, <clears throat> gave me the privilege of, of leading this group, so, and I thank him for that honor. Every day? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, there's quite a few people that are here watching this. We don't usually get so many people watching meetings. Um, if anybody's expecting some of the theatrics that occurred last time, I took a pill this morning, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, let, uh, let's go around the table and introduce each other, and then, uh, and then we can proceed. So, Matt, why don't you start? Sure. Matt Esposito, FASB staff member. Sue Casper, FASB staff. Sydney Garmon, Crow Horwath. Diane Bellis, Allstate. Uh, Hal Schroeder, FASB. Robert Wadley, Ernst & Young. Barb Vanich, PCAOB. Kevin Staklosa, First Niagara Bank. Jim Zimmerman, Standard Bank. Dan Pelamaki, Citigroup. Mark Northen, KPMG. Mario Mastrantoni, Wells Fargo. <clears throat> Bob Storch, FDIC. Jeffrey Gear, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. John Howard, Deloitte & Touche. Tom Linsmeyer, FASB. Helen Kellogg, Bank of Montreal. Susan Hannigan, Sean Dock Credit Union. Graham Dyer, Grant Thornton. Chip Curry, PwC. Jim Croker, FASB. Steve Brown, Private Company Council. Wes Brecker, SCC. Andrew Thornburg, FASB staff. Jack Pullman, FASB staff. Uh, Russ Golden, FASB. Okay, and I'm Larry Smith, FASB. Um, again, I'm sincere in, uh, in, in what I say, thanking you for your participation because it's really through your participation that we um, improve what we do in terms of standard setting. Um, this is, oh, I'm sorry, there's two people on the phone. Um, so Doug Wright, are you there? Yes. Okay, and Shi Hao, are you there? Yeah, Shi Hao, stepped out for a minute, but he'll, he'll return. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is not the first meeting of this group, although it is the first meeting in public. Um, back in September, I think it was, we had a more informal meeting uh, to discuss <clears throat> the staff draft at that point in time. Um, we've kind of improvised on how our TRG for Cecil <clears throat> is operating and we're doing it a little bit differently than the revenue recognition TRG. Um, we felt that if we had the involvement with TRG members before the issuance of the final standard, that we would, in fact, um, issue a better standard with um, <clears throat> perhaps less need to provide any implementation guidance post-issuance. And I think, quite frankly, the September meeting was was extremely helpful uh, to the board. Um, there were several issues that were raised at that September meeting um, that came back to the board for re for re-deliberation, uh, as well as several key points um, that were considered in drafting um, <clears throat> and in the preparation of the draft that, that you all have and that's available on our website. So, you know, in terms of today's meeting, you know, I'd like to just, um, Considering the fact that the FASB is a very rules-based organization, I'd like to set up a couple of rules for this meeting. Um, the real objective of the meeting is, is to provide the board and the staff with any concerns and suggestions you have regarding the draft that was distributed to you. Um, if you will, this is kind of your last bite at the apple. Um, we do not want to uh, get into a debate as to the decisions the board has made. Um, those decisions are <clears throat> have been made. You know, there are a couple of board members that might want to do that, but you know, we're not going to get into that. So let's let's put those concerns that you might have aside, and let's just focus on the decisions that have been made and whether the draft reflects those decisions in a manner that you all can implement. At the last meeting, I started off purposefully. Um, giving an example of a particular situation and the fact that the proposed standard 
would enable people to use different methods to calculate the allowance for loan losses. Um, and I did so purposefully because the use of different methods could give different outcomes in terms of an allowance. And I wanted to make sure that the people <clears throat> around the table um, were comfortable with the fact that you could get different outcomes. Um, specifically, I was interested in whether the banking regulators, the SEC, the PCAOB, and the auditors in the room would be comfortable with that. And at that meeting, everybody said that they were comfortable. Um, and therefore, we're proceeding um, as, as we, as through, with the decisions that we've made. In terms of this specific meeting, um, this is not a drafting session, okay? So if you have um, minor details or minor comments, you know, please give them to the staff um, after the meeting or, you know, <clears throat> uh, next week sometime. Um, but I'd rather not get into a specific drafting session. That's not our objective. The objective is for you all to, to raise significant concerns you might have in terms of how things have been drafted. And finally, we're here really to discuss the draft that was submitted to you on, on topic 326 and really not on any of the consequential amendments which we have not distributed to you. So if we could just focus on, on, on the fundamental um, <clears throat> Cecil model, it would be great. And then lastly, if you do have points, it would be very helpful if you um, give us the specific paragraph reference so we all know where to turn. Um, you know, some of us have not memorized this document, so it, it would just be helpful, particularly for older people like me, so. Um, with that, I think we can get started. Now, we sent you, you know, several questions, and quite frankly, um, those were kind of um, low arc, slow softball pitch type questions. Um, so I'm going to kind of open it up and for you all to just start talking about any concerns or issues or things you think are worth discussing. Um, and I have not um, teed up one of you to start the conversation, so I would appreciate it if somebody were brave to start it off. If not, we can go home. I'll start off. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to serve on this, the TRG. I'm the newbie. I'm the, I wasn't here for the last meeting, but I'm very honored to serve with this distinguished group, and I'll do my best to be a positive and productive member of the group. And uh, Actually, my service on the TRG here gives over 6,000 community banks, which is one of the largest, if not la one of the, the largest constituency that's going to have to abide by the standard here, a voice in the process, and, and that's very much appreciated. In terms of uh, where we are, I think we've come a long way since the famous uh, February 4th meeting. Um, I think the text of the revised standard and the specific questions on the agenda that you referred to, Larry, clearly show that there's an intent to make this standard flexible and scalable and to allow community banks to use their experience and understanding of the local business marketplace to meet the requirements of the new standard and ascertain the most appropriate allowance for loan and lease losses. Uh, we think that this draft validates what we've been doing in practice, while it adds the ability to provide for expected credit losses. However, it doesn't require us to use reserves, to increase reserves if an increase isn't really appropriate and allows us to use historical loss data where appropriate. We think that's very important. We believe it is the intent of this standard to allow community bank management to use current systems and, yes, the all-important spreadsheets and narratives to us. Uh, coupled with enhanced techniques to evaluate and document the adequacy of the allowance. And uh, uh, it's clear from reading the draft that the requirements are generally scalable. It, it, that permeates the whole draft now, I think, which, which we think is really important and provides for a high degree of flexibility. There is one area, though, I think that maybe there, a little bit more attention be, could be given to, and that's in uh, the disclosure requirements that they start on page 19. I don't I did the page number. I didn't do the, uh, okay. uh, the uh, paragraph number. But more importantly, that's just where they start. And there's a lot of flexibility that's in the language 
from that point on. But then I'm focused on the ex example 15, which is right at the back of the, uh, of the document. And um, while that example says it illustrates that a financial institution with a narrower range of products, three basically, key products, it, um, it shows an extensive disclosure of information that's really not typical of community banks. Um, we'd like to see a modified example 15 or maybe even another example. Example 15 can stand, and I think that's probably a good example for the larger financial institutions, but uh, for community banks, it'd be nice to have an example that's based on collection or delinquency experience because that's really what we're most familiar with, and when you think of the scale of what we're working with, if you look at example 15, it really doesn't work for us, and it's not information that we typically provide, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, such uh, extensive and voluminous that it, it really won't uh, be appropriate for us. And whether or not, whether we like it or not, when there's an example like that in there, that really becomes the benchmark. And so when the auditors and examiners are looking at what the disclosure should look like, there it is. Here's probably what it should look like. And so if we could come up with another example that's a sort of a community bank-based example, I think that would be very important. Okay. I, I I think that's helpful, and <clears throat> quite frankly, I think our staff can can work with you or whoever you think appropriate to um, to consider the typical lending environment of a relatively small community bank. So we'll we'll take that under advisement. Thank you, Jeff. This is Jeff Gear with the OCC. I just wanted to uh, open up before we get into the details, and, and first of all, thank the staff and and the board for their work on this project. I know it's been a long long time. Uh, but the reaction from my team at the OCC, and I think I can speak for the other uh, financial institution regulators when we read this draft, is that we, th we think that it is a significant improvement um, over earlier drafts in terms of understandability and addressing stakeholder concerns about operationability. So um, just wanted to, to start Great. off with that. Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, I, echoing uh, Jeff on that, I think it's the, the document is, is very clear now, and I think it's uh, it's going to be a lot easier to implement with this language than, than the past language. Um, just one, one comment I had on, on paragraph 326, 2030-9 on page 13, as it's a re the reversion paragraph. And I noticed the language says reversion to historical cost um, or, or um, historical loss, and, and I think that that's – that's great, because that's how I was always thinking about it. In the past, I don't know if there's ever words to reversion to the mean, but there was always discussion about reversion to the mean. And I never knew what that really meant mm -hmm. um, from, from, the, from the credit loss perspective. So the way it's written now, I think it's, it's clear, and I think it's you know, something we can implement. Um, but I just wanted to kind of confirm that with you all, is that kind of what you were, you were thinking versus a reversion to the mean uh, idea? Um, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it, it's a reversion to a historical loss. Yes, Dan. I just uh, <clears throat> some general uh, comments as well to, to start things off, and you know, really agree with what uh, Jeff was saying and, and Kevin as well. I think the staff has done a fantastic job uh, with uh, the most recent draft that we have here on the core CECL model itself. Um, you know, we've had a number of folks uh, at City in the finance area as well as our risk organization looking after corporate loans and consumer loans. Uh, reading through this, and we feel uh, comfortable that we can implement this. We, you know, we think um, the the time is right now for the the board to move forward to kind of to, to finalize the standard. Um, and I'm sure there'll be you know implementation issues that we'll all work uh, together collectively on. But you know, we're we're ready to get going and kind of remove the uncertainty. And you know, we're already. Uh, moving down the field on IFRS 9 adoption and really want to sync this up with that as well. So, okay. Thank you. I forgot to preface this. Uh, you know, as, as much as I like all of you, I'm hopeful that this is the last TRG meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that April Fool's joke? Yeah. There'll be one for implementation. Oh, no, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, John. Thanks, Larry. Um, I'd like to th thank everyone for, for their efforts. I think this is uh, a, a big step forward from the last draft that we saw. Uh, on 30-9, um, I, I guess two, two thoughts. One, and I think we kind of had this theme last time too, uh, 
there are a lot of places we need to make estimates in accounting, and it seems like we're really trying to say, you know, when you should adjust historical and reverting back. I know we're not at least saying straight line back, but I, personally, I find 30-9 still a bit confusing. I think if we've laid out the principle of we're just trying to come up with expected lifetime losses, I don't know if we need a lot of detailed guidance telling us what we should be adjusting historical for and, and, and making sure we revert back to it. Um, Within this paragraph, it talks about historical information being over an economic cycle, yet the life of an asset, we're supposed to look at the contractual life of the asset. And so I was a bit confused at if the contractual asset is longer than the historical cycle, am I only supposed to look at historical information for one economic cycle and then just like keep repeating that over and over? Or, and, and, and then adjusting from it, the, the information about, you know, economic conditions, I was confused what, that we're not supposed to use economic conditions. So I found this, this, especially the second half of the paragraph, to be very confusing. Okay. This paragraph um, got a lot of attention within the last two weeks, all right? Um, and I, we were trying to convey to you that there are certain things that you need to consider um, but we were tr not trying to be specific. So in, in direct response to your question about can you look over more than one economic cycle, we did not intend to limit you to the most recent or a particular economic cycle. That's first. In terms of putting in the words about the economic cycle, we did so um, to address those situations where a, the life of a loan might be equal to or greater than the life of an economic cycle, but also for you to think about what happens when your life of loan is really less than a complete economic cycle, then I think you have to sit back and think about are you in a, you know, what part of the economic cycle you should be thinking about or whether you should whether it's appropriate to look at a full economic cycle. So we're not trying to pen you in to, to one particular way of doing it. We tried to, to lay out um, various things that one should consider, all right? So I, we understand that there's some concern over this paragraph, and, and quite frankly, even after this went out, different people were taking a pen to paper to try to um, better articulate um, what we were thinking, but at the end of the day, the words that are on this page probably will not be the final words, and we'll do some more um, tweaking. But um, I don't think anything. I don't think I disagree with anything you just said. So let me ask you, John. Do you do you, ag do you agree with the philosophy that Larry's articulated? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I do. So, so do you think the better way? to deal with this paragraph is to have less prescription because yeah. that philosophy will be the way practice will do it or do you think we should have more prescription to, to say what he said? I, it's similar to other areas in GAAP. I don't, I don't think we need a lot of prescription on how to come up with the estimate. Um, and and I, f I, f I don't know if telling is the right word, but I found it kind of telling that when you got back to the examples, even and some of them will, where we say we can only look at one year or two years that we think is different than historical, it was hard to tell. We would just say add this many basis points. It was hard to tell even how the reversion worked and what the historical would have told you and why you were adjusting it for how you were when you could only guess two years of the seven years or two of the five. Yeah, so. there, were, there, were, there was not enough detail in the examples to enable you to, to see how it was done. Right. Um, and I, there was one example I thought last time that did show, granted that was with straight line, I'm, I'm glad straight line went away, um, but there was an example before that showed this reversion process. Um, but again, I, I'm probably more for the less is more. I don't know that I want that example, I don't know that I want this much in this paragraph as long as we've laid out historical is maybe a good place to start, but don't just run with historical, <laughs> probably enough. Okay. You were, you were no. nodding, you agree with that? I do. Yeah, um, I, I think less prescription is better. I, th I think we make lots of estimates on the balance sheet. I don't know that we need a reasonable and supportable sort of threshold. I think the reference to contractual term could be um, referenced back to the consideration of prepayments so as not to cause confusion. 
and I think the bottom of that paragraph where it references uh, the histor adjustment of historical loss information that is not adjusted for economic conditions, that seems confusing to me. I would think you would adjust it for economic conditions, and in fact, I think in example one, you are adjusting it for economic conditions, so I could think it could use some clarification. Jim. So th that word, not economic conditions, I think, one, that wasn't board drafting. Uh, several of us read that and didn't l likewise think it captured exactly what we were trying to to convey, I think it was trying to say that you might make an adjustment for which you don't revert if it was, for example, a change in underwriting standards. Right. Uh, and so I think it, it was trying to convey something and then saying that those effectively are, you know, underwriting standards are not economic conditions, but I think the placement of that wording perhaps got a little confused. So that, that piece I think you can rest easy that we're not all comfortable that it's sitting in the right spot. The, the, the thing I, I struggle with is, and I'd love to hear from some of the, the smaller um, institutions about having some, it, it was almost safe harbor's not the right word, but you know some guidance that says, look, if you do this in a less refined way, which is you think about it and say straight line, you don't actually have to go out and, and figure out that which you don't know. You don't have to do more work to figure out that which you don't know, but you shouldn't freeze economic conditions at a point in time. You should somehow get those back to sort of a reversion to historical. Uh, and, and so I think it was trying to provide some comfort as much to smaller organizations as it was um, not trying to constrain the larger who might be able to do it in a more sophisticated way. Right. Mark. I, uh, I mean, I agree with the overall sentiment that less prescription is more when it comes to accomplishing the principles that, uh, that the board laid out. I think I, you know, I, I do think that there should be a, well, we'll call it, I don't know if it's really a principle, I'll call it a principle behind the uh, historical loss information that is being reverted to. Um, because I think that's almost like the measurement attribute for uh, a good part of the estimate, the estimate that takes place beyond the reasonable and supportable period. I think the flexibility, I think, is great on how you revert from the reasonable and supportable adjustments to the historical experience, but I do think there at least needs to be a principle set out for how to measure the historical experience, and I think that's still, or the historical loss information, I think that's still a little bit unclear, even, Larry, with your with your comments. I, I, I took this to be you take an, that the, the historical loss information should be an average measurement over a long period that includes a peak and a trough, and that that average should be the concept whether you have a one-year loan or whether you have a 30-year loan, that the idea is that it's, uh, you know, it's an average experience over a period that includes a peak and a trough. Now, I may be wrong because I think the words are still a little bit unclear. Assuming your underwriting standards are the same. What's that? Assuming your underwriting standards are the same. Yeah, I guess maybe I was focused more on the economic conditions, but or actually, it says I think it says you may adjust for the underwriting standards uh, in the paragraph right now. But uh, okay. that, that's what I. So I, maybe I want to sort of confirm: is that what we're supposed to be taking away from it? It's sort of an average loss experience over a longer period that includes a peak and a trough, and you'd apply that whether it's a one-year loan or a thirty-year loan, or or. Am I still off the mark? No, I think you're on the mark. I mean, to Jim's okay. point, I think what, it, to the extent that you don't take that type of a view, there's questions as to whether we are um, providing a practical expedient at all. So I would agree with what you said. But I, th I think the fundamental question, though, is between what Mark said and what Kevin said. I think Kevin said, um, am I looking at a historical period, not a mean. I think Mark just said, I'm looking at a mean. No, okay, then I, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean a mean, I meant a lot. What your loss experience is. But, but, but wouldn't it potentially even depend on what method you're using, right? If you're just applying a flat loss rate to a balance, then it probably is more of like what Mark's talking about. But if you're doing a DCF and the timing of the cash flows matters too, you might be doing something that's more cyclical right. and isn't the same number throughout. You might actually be looking at the peaks and the troughs. Mm -hmm. But I think, John, if you have a, a, a long-term asset, 
looking at a historical period over a long term, you're probably going to capture an economic cycle. I think it's to your point earlier about, well, what if I have a one-year asset? Do I look just over a one-year period, or do I take an average one-year period over maybe seven years? And, and that's, that's, I think, part of the question that's working through the, the group right now. And, and maybe it would be helpful to provide a little context of, of some of our thinking uh, from the staff when drafting this paragraph. But um, there's, there's generally two perspectives that I'm hearing. There's, there's the perspective that, um, you know, be clear that it's a longer-term average. Um, maybe economic cycle is a difficult term to use, but that's, that was the intent of, of those words. And then other people have expressed a view that, you know, don't be specific, just say historical loss experience. And when talking about it, you know, amongst the staff, we were um, concerned with saying just pick your historical loss experience because what does that mean? And in, this is a period beyond the reasonable and supportable forecast. So how would one pick which period to, to, to look at that loss over? So, for example, if, you, if it just says pick your historical loss experience and you have a portfolio of, let's say, four-year loans and you have 16 years of data, do you pick one of the middle four years? Do you pick the beginning four years? And, and would you need to support that? And how would you even begin to support that for the periods where you have no idea what uh, the economy is going to be after one or two years? And so we said this is intended to be a practical expedient, if you will. And um, we wanted to provide you know, a long-term economic average where it's, it's clear what the intent is. And so you would look at your, you know, your, your longer term picture of the loss history over that time, hopefully it would de-emphasize some of the pressure on which historical period do you pick specifically. Um, and that was a little bit of the intent and, you know, just thought maybe that would provide some insight on the discussion here. Bob Storch. I think we also struggle with the paragraph on reversion. And I think the flexibility makes sense, especially as John was suggesting, depending on what method you use, that may affect what kind of reversion you have. And even when, if you look at examples one and two, which is sort of the simple loss rate method, which we would expect most community banks would try to build off of, it almost seems like there isn't an explicit revision, reversion. It's almost implicit in the methodology because you're coming up with a long-term average loss rate and just adjusting it for the reasonable and supportable forecast. And, you're coming up with a single number, not different estimates for different periods of time. So I think the flexibility is good, but I think having some guidance, particularly for community banks and examiners who would be looking at community banks, would be helpful. Okay. Chip. So I, did, I just want to make sure I understood, you know, j everything we've heard so far. So. Um, is the intention to give a practical expedient that you could revert to a long-term average irrespective of the remaining loans term, whether it was one year or 10 years, you could just revert to a long-term average and that's kind of a, a practical expedient? Yeah, oh, a long-term average of a one-year rate or a long-term average of a five-year rate, uh, uh, an average of a rate that reflects the, ter you know, the term of the loan. Well, I mean, it strikes me if... Because if you don't do that, effectively, you really haven't given a practical expedient. Because then you'll have to support which rate do you go with. Right, and, and I, I understand that if you want to do more than that, you, you might be able to could say that's a reasonable and supportable forecast. But if that, if that was the staff's intent, um, then it strikes me we would need to amend this paragraph, but it strikes me that that could be done, I mean, with, with wording changes and perhaps tying it a little bit into example um, you know that are in the back where we talk about you know we made this adjustment and what this adjustment was designed to do was um, you know adjust lifetime credit losses that we expect because of the economic cycle over the reasonable and supportable forecast and that's why that's how that ex these examples tie into this mean reversion it strikes me that that's something that could be done through through drafting okay Graham Thanks. Uh, first of all, this discussion gives me a tremendous amount of sympathy for the staff who've been asked to do something impossible. Um, so, <laughs> well done. I, th I think actually it's a great draft. Um, we were, and I'm going to ask for something impossible here too. Um, you know, I think 
first of all, I think John's and Mark's and Chip's comments are all well taken, and particularly Bob's in that we've got clients that span the sophistication spectrum. And so for some, prescription is, is dangerous because it almost limits their ability to get smarter over time. If they find a better estimate, I think they're concerned that they won't be able, if there's prescription in the standard, that they might be restricted from using that. I know that's not the intent, especially not what Larry articulated. But I think for those at the other end of the sophistication spectrum, it's really helpful to have that sort of stuff in there. So I suppose it's important to allow for both, which seems like I'm asking for the impossible. So I'm sorry for that, but I do think that is, in fact, important. <laughs> and so I think you've done a, a remarkable job, and I don't think it's going to take a whole lot more to get to the sort of utopian thing I'm asking for. But. Okay, thank you. Dan? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> we thought in paragraph 9 the language was significantly improved, and we, we think, you know, we could uh, work with what's there. You know, the, the last two sentences are significant improvements over the draft we were looking at uh, back in September. Uh, and I, you know, I know we have different portfolios where we really have to marry kind of internal data and external data. Uh, typically for corporate loans, we have data that goes over kind of three economic cycles that, that we utilize. Now, we have more data probably than most folks do. Other portfolios, you know, we may have 10 years worth of data and then we'll tie on to that additional data we get from Moody's to to you know to build up to uh, loss rates and so I think the language that you have here you know has that flexibility uh, allows folks to do that you know I understand that the sentence that focuses on you know it could be read to mean that you have to at least consider a whole economic cycle for some that could be limiting and it could be a bit restrictive uh, but I think you know kind of elaborating on um, uh, the ideas that, that you had outlined would be helpful here. And you know, maybe, you know, not saying it has to be a whole economic cycle, but you know, you're trying to reflect data um, over a long enough period of time that captures upturns and downturns. So, you know, there's ways to work with the language. Okay. Thank you. Tom? I think in some respects in paragraph 9 we may have overwritten it as some people are talking about, but I think that the primary message you're trying to get, and I want a reaction to see if you disagree, is that what we're saying is that we're not telling you how long the historical period has to be that you're starting with, because you may not have data as you're going into this, but you've got a historical period, whatever it is, whatever you think is relevant. And then we ask you, once you have that historical period, not year by year, but on a lifetime basis, how the economics in the current conditions and forecastable period differ from the economics in that base period, the historical period for which you have, and to make an adjustment, a lifetime loss adjustment for those differences. And in some of the conversations, Bob, that you're talking about, it starts feeling like, it, no, it's a one or two year adjustment. No, it's an adjustment to what we think the lifetime losses is for that difference. And I think what we're trying to say in this paragraph now you can revert immediately or in any other way you want to the to an historical loss information but to the extent the historical loss information that you're starting with is isolated in a small cycle and doesn't represent economic space through the cycle think about another qualitative adjustment to be able to do so and i think that's what we're trying to communicate i don't know that we've done it very eff completely effectively here but that's the process I think we're trying to communicate. And if you differ or have a challenge, that would be useful to know. But, but you would agree to what Dan and others have said. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so I think it's just a matter of I'm how, how we're describing it and what's the most effective way to describe it. Yeah, I'm not yeah. disagreeing. I, I think I'm saying things very consistent with some of the people. Okay. This, is, this is Doug Wright. Um, you know, I think this is, a, as I agree with everyone else, I think this is a dramatic improvement over the previous drafting. I think one of the, what it seems like we're struggling with is maybe the, prescri the prescriptive economic cycle language, um, because that, you know, the language in the paragraph indicates that you shall reflect the historical loss of information over an economic cycle. And everyone's struggling with that term economic cycle and what that really means and how does that relate to the example at the back. Uh, 
So I wonder if, if the language around economic cycle could just be softened to make that again more uh, flexible so that uh, there can be a different interpretation and more room to move within what is considered an appropriate historical loss period. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Doug. Can I, I hate to have board member to board member discussion, but um, can I just clarify something you just said? So let's say your typical economic cycle is eight years, okay? And let's say the loan portfolio that we have is, uh, has a three, three year life or whatever. What you're saying is, and let's say we're just in the part of the cycle where things are getting worse. Okay, I think what I heard you say was, if your loss rate for an entire economic cycle, assuming same underwriting, et cetera, was 1.2%, and recently, for the most recent two years, you had 1.5%, and you're still getting worse, that would probably be inappropriate to look at the 1.2%. Did I understand that correctly? It's hard. Yes, from my perspective, I, I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think if, what we have to do is give flexibility to say you're starting with a one point. What was the the number in the most recent years? The most recent was one point five for three years, and it's getting worse. And it's getting worse. Yes. So I think depending on what you're doing in your adjustment for current conditions and reasonable supportable forecasts. The degree to that adjustment reflecting those differences, then you're going to say you're going to come back to some period, right, with no knowledge. That's what's going at that period. What do we come back to? Right. And, and I think you'd have to think about the contractual term of that particular instrument that, that you don't have a reasonable supportable forecast to and whether it's worthwhile to come back to 1.3 or well, 1.2, somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the thought process that has to be undertaken just to be able to do the adjustment from current for base numbers to current and supportable conditions. Okay. And think carefully if you've only got two years and it's a five year instrument and the two years is in an isolated time period, think about what you come back to qualitatively. Okay. So, so can I um, just respond to Tom? So Tom, would you agree that different companies will have different bases? Yes. And it's just important to really emphasize what your current condition adjustment is. Yes. So if you agree with that, should, should we then define the base or allow people to pick their base that they, they think is most appropriate but still emphasize they need to be sure about the forecast and the current conditions? I think they have to pick their base <coughs> that's historical that's most appropriate considering uh, economic cycles and contract term because if the contract term shorter than the economic cycle you're never going to get back to to the other years never you're never going to get back to some part of that cycle so I think it's got to be both and I overstated when I said economic cycle but you have to think if the quality if the base historical number is in a small amount of years whether you want to go back to it or not okay. Wes It seems like to, to some extent we're, um, we're trying to standardize uh, the logic and rationale. And so I, I, I think that puts me perhaps closer to uh, John Howard's uh, comment um, you know, at the start of the discussion where- Less is more? Less may be more, uh, more or less. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and the reason I draw on that uh, is O over time, you know, our, our guidance, uh, whether expressed, um, you know, in our books and records requirements, which simply frame it in keeping your books in reasonable detail, uh, further down, uh, then, you know, the commission has guidance that says apply logic and ration, and then the staff has guidance in SAB 102 that, that talks about our procedural discipline. I, I think those, those concepts deal with highly uncertain estimates uh, quite well. I think what, what we're dealing with here is trying to navigate uh, significant amounts of measurement uncertainty. And I think um, 
some good core concepts of apply um, you know, your best judgment uh, in the circumstances of the information that you have available uh, with a consistently run and well thought out process. It seems like that gets you to um, you know, a supportable and, and documented a estimate that, that then could be examined, could be audited. So um, I'm not sure standardizing in a prescriptive way r really enables you to achieve yeah. um, what we're trying to do. Okay. Jim? So I, I, I hear that, and, and I think the concern was we're talking about the period you can't estimate. And Tom, even as you described it, it sounded like it's the period I can't estimate, but I have to estimate it because I have to figure out economically how it would revert. And I think we're dealing, at least at the smaller institution level, which is what, coming back to why this guidance was here, it was an outcry from the exposure draft. It said, I'm going to have to estimate for the entire life. And we said, no, you don't. You only have to go out as far as you can go. And is the more we get into then saying, but as far as you can go, you now have to go further because you have to figure out how that would come back to the mean. And I thought this was put in there to be very practical to say, no, you don't have to do that. And Once you can't figure something out, you don't have to model out that which you can't model. I, and, and while I agree with that, okay, and that was the board's conclusion, I think at the same time we want to provide enough flexibility so that um, preparers and auditors and regulators can feel comfortable with the estimate. And I'll, I'll just, and I, we've had this discussion Let's use before, the best estimate. before. When you have a relatively short contract period and you say that I can only look out two years, at, let's say a three year term, and you know, I can only look out two years, but, and if I were an auditor, <clears throat> and the, the, the mean was calculated during a significantly different economics, economic cycle. I don't think that the economic cycle is just going to turn around and go right back to what it used to be. So that, that was the only point that I was trying to make, is to allow a certain amount of flexibility in terms of coming, coming up with those judgments. And I, I appreciate you're right. We put in the practical expedient so that people would not, because they cannot, see beyond. But you so I, I agree with the, you completely, Larry. Let, but the more we tell you how to do it, oh, and then I, I, I'm not suggesting that we must model it, Jim. I'm not suggesting that we put that in the standard. And as a matter of fact, I'm getting to the point of John's suggestion that we put less in. But I don't want to um, handcuff somebody to say I must revert to this lower mean when what I see is a lot fuzzier. But still, I can see something. You know what I mean? And that's okay. what I was saying. I think we're going to agree. You may consider those differences if you understand. Just to Tom's last point, I mean, we used, I think we used the word shall, shall reflect. Should it be shall consider? With that, in terms of softening the guidance? Does he want to talk? Shihao, do you want to, um, you had sent me an email mentioning wanting to try and yeah. get Yeah, Matt, thanks. I mean, I, I think, you know, consider probably, you know, give you a little bit more flexibility so you can consider and decide you know, not to use the entire cycle, use a portion of the cycle and or not. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility. Reflect when we first read it, it seems like you have to put it in the entire cycle. I, I just, I mean, listen to everyone's comments, um, especially Tom's, I, I feel like, we do need the flexibility. It's not one size fits all uh, when you incorporate your historical information for the purpose of reversion. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thanks. I, I vote for uh, less is more because I think just I think no. I think this discussion demonstrates that, doesn't it? You can't get to the point where you're going to be prescriptive enough to satisfy what you're looking for. And and just think of I, I think of okay, let's test this. Let's think about what would we do with this guidance in 2007 and 8 and 9. There's no economic cycle. I mean, so, so I'm in the economic cycle. The contractual term is longer. Okay. What am I going back to? It, it's going to come to the point where you have to allow judgment because, again, 
the people that are re responsible for the financial statements know their business, they know the area that they're working in, and they're going to have to make a judgment about what this reserve should be. So at some point you have to allow, allow them to do that because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are responsible for the financial statements. And the more you try to change these words around and the more you try to get more prescriptive, the harder it's going to get. So I, I think you've you got to back off a little bit, go with the spirit of what's in here, but not get down to the point where you're worrying about whether it's shall or may or something like that, at least relative to this subsection. Okay. Thank you. Mark? I think I, I would make the comment that just using your 1.5 and 1.2 uh, example earlier, I would have said that the historical loss information over an economic cycle was the 1.2. Um, and so if you were immediately to revert, you would immediately revert to the 1.2. I, I feel like your concern, Larry, is more around the methods that should be used to revert to that 1.2, where maybe you're, you're saying there may be circumstances where immediate reversion shouldn't feel good to somebody when they, uh, you know, are um, in, in a certain uh, forecasted direction of the, of the economy or something like that. But um, I think if, the, if there is a practical expedient, like we're calling it, then it's helpful to have, um, you know, a, a more objective measure of, uh, you know, of historical losses. And then you can get into, well, but then, you know, should there be different methods permitted in terms of how to, uh, how to revert to that number? Um, so I want to make that comment, and then if I can direct a, a question to Wes, if we can go uh, member to member, and you said maybe less is more, less prescriptive. Were, were your points more that 30-9, maybe we shouldn't have a practical expedient, maybe we should just allow good judgment uh, in all cases, or were, you, was your, were your comments really around the practical expedient itself should be less prescriptive? So, so my, my comment was framed in relation to the to the current language, I don't see uh, a, at least an explicit reference to a practical expedient. So, so it implies that I'm working through a standardized uh, judgment process. Um, and and so, if if we want to land on a practical expedient, I wouldn't object to that. I, I I would simply suggest that that we describe it as a practical expedient. We have them in a number of significant other estimate areas, including pensions. Um, it, and and so that's that's what I was reacting to to the extent that that we leave it outside of a practical expedient realm then I think the best solution is to solve it through um, good rigorous procedural discipline um, because I I appreciate uh, Jim and other you know, Jim's point and and others that um, we may be beyond the point that we know what the outcome will be it's highly uncertain um, and, and so how do you judge the quality of that estimate and that out period? To my thinking, you judge the quality by the consistency or the quality of your process. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, I think so. I think so. <coughs> Chip? You know, it strikes me that what we're talking about is whether or not we provide for uh, you know, Wes, to your point, like a practical expedient. In, in my mind, the way a practical expedient works is you say, you have a reasonable and supportable forecast, and after that, you do X. And that's what practical expedient is. A or do we say that you can do X as long as X is, um, you know, a rational thing to do? So, for example, uh, you know, I've got a a very long-term loan, and so the rational thing to do would be to mean revert to a long-term average. I've got a loan that's only got two years left beyond the reasonable and supportable forecast, so it wouldn't necessarily be rational to, you know, revert to a 20-year average, you know, or you know, as opposed to more annual. You know. So that seems to me to be the inherent question: Are we are we just going to give a practical expedient that says what you do, or frame it a little bit to say it, it's a practical expedient, but there has to be some level of rationality in what you've done. Jim. So, so what if we, to, to kind of maybe couple both those points, I think you're talking about a discipline consistent process uh, across s similar or consistent facts. Obviously, the facts changed and approach might change, but 
it seems like you know combining a systematic and rational sort of notion versus trying to be prescriptive. So once you're out in the in the dark space, what you need to, to do is systematic. It, it occurs consistently in consistent facts, and it needs to be rational without trying to describe what all of the rational approaches might be. Tom? With the practical expedient that you can just do a straight line if you want, or immediately if, if you want. Yeah. Which is sort of like depreciation. Do systematic and rational, but people default to straight lines. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we want to introduce in the system a high evaluation if, if you're not doing it immediately to justify you do it, unless you have a basis for doing that. And that's what I think the straight line practical expedient is, is to say you can fall back to that without having to justify it. Okay. Graham? Thanks, Larry. Um, I think if you kind of take all of our comments, you can probably triangulate something that looks like what Mark suggested a principle as to what that period or what that historical information should be. I guess my only concern is that if we, if we just take the paragraph and just say kind of stop it after the entity shall revert to historical laws of information and then say as a practical expedient you might, blah, 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 there's still sort of lacking in the paragraph something like a principle it's sort of like uh, we've got turn-by-turn -turn directions, but we don't know what the destination is. Um, I think it might be helpful to have somewhere in all of this is something that sounds like a principle as to what we're trying to achieve, and it's really hard to articulate, and I don't propose to have that off the top of my head. Hmm. Um, <laughs> you can I'll, email it later. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm sure I'll figure it out in the flight home. But, um, but anyway, I, I just think, I think practical expedience is great. I think consistency is, is great. I think we probably also need some notion about what we want what that historical information is trying to capture as well. Okay. If, if, we, if we say less is best here, and if we just stop with revert to historical loss information, is everybody comfortable that they can support what that is? Is it the information that respects their expected environment? Is it the information that reflects their current environment? And how would you all how would you all, like, if, if a regulator, if an auditor said, well, how, why this period and why not that period, do you all feel that you could understand how to support it? John? And we do that with all kinds of estimates all the time without anybody telling us how to revert MSRs, valuing MSRs, like fair value. I mean, we do that all the time. Okay. Where we fair value over the life, not fair value, but calculated allowances over the life of the loan. So is that, Today. Is, uh, agreed, I, 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 you're 100% you're right, but is that reversion then? No. It's not reversion, so well, my point is, it's is estimating the full period. figure it out, right? We, we have processes in place, we use judgment, we look at all kinds of economic data. We, we, we do it today, we all do it today, the community banks, the big banks. Yeah. I mean, I'm just concerned if you put in qualifiers about what you should and shouldn't do, that somehow that limits us going forward. Not, not well, that I'm trying to belabor this, but I mean, getting back to Larry's example, where with the 1.2 and the 1.5, but it's getting worse, reversion would imply you're going from 1.5 to 1.2, but he's saying, no, it's getting worse, I should be going the other direction. So uh, personally, I don't like the word reversion, because that implies one direction. I, I, I just feel like trying to put words around all the different scenarios, just lay out the principle of expected lifetime losses, and we've been able to deal with this deferred tax asset value. Like, we've been able to deal with this in a lot of other areas without specificity on how to come up with the estimate. I, I, I think the example that I gave, and I did it purposefully, I, I think it's really calling into question a person's assertion that their reasonable and supportable forecast pe period is only one year or two years. That's what I think it's doing. You know, is it appropriate for you to then say, well, I can't see beyond 30 days, so therefore I'm going to go back to my historical loss experience. So I, I, I think that's what it's doing. And, and, and I appreciate the fact, you know, like Jim Croker is saying, well, if you're going to give a practical expedient, give a practical expedient. But I think it has to be a, a rational implementation of, of saying that you're you're taking a practical expedient. If it's if it's not rational, 
um, because cycles have lasted at least X number of years, and we're just beginning entering into the poor part of the cycle. And uh, as an auditor, I think I might question, you know, whether that's a, a it, whether it, it is really appropriate for you to say that I can't see any further than, you know, this one year point. That, that's my concern with the term practical expedient, is that there might be circumstances where people can just default to it and say, I don't want to project. And we would agree going into 2008, we wouldn't be comfortable with just historical averages. So I'd like to, Tim, you know, your community bank representative, and a lot of the concerns about reasonable and supportable have been raised by community banks in terms of, well, are you going to, you know, do I have to hire a bunch of economists to, to forecast this, et cetera? I mean, how do you feel about it? Because I, I thought. Well, I, I, I agree with what you, just, what you just said about, look, you can take anything and abuse it. And so, yeah, I can't see beyond tomorrow because who knows what's going to happen, right? So I'm just going to go to the easy answer. So, so, so there has to be some um, benchmark in there about what is reasonable. But I think it's the same thing about, in general, we're making all these estimates all the time, and if it's not reasonable, then it's going to be reasonably clear that it's not reasonable, okay? Yeah, honestly. Okay. I'm not, so no, That's helpful. No, so because um, everything else we do, we need to support. And if you put, if you take an unreasonable position and then you document what that is, if I do that, so then my auditor comes in and says, <coughs> I don't know where you were when you did this, but you weren't here, so I completely disagree with that. It's not okay. Well, then I'm going to have to come. I'm going to have to change it because there's and say it's going to be a material difference. So now I'm going to have to deal with that. So um, I think you can. I still think that less is more. I think you you have, maybe have to put something in. It's not default to. I'm just going to go with historical. And again, I bring up my example of what would have we done at the beginning of this uh, the, the financial crisis. It, it, if you've got a prescriptive thing in there, it's not going to work. And so you have to allow the flexibility for people to deal with the facts as they are today. And so I, I, I don't know how you get to what the benchmark for, for what you said about reasonable is, but if you can get to there, then I think the rest of the answer is you go, you, you, you know, you use what you think is the best thing to use. And maybe you pick a, a cycle that seems most like what you're going through now. And it's so you, so you say, I'm going back to here. But then that's my judgment, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to support that. But I don't want to be told this is what I have to do. Okay, that's helpful, Robert. Thanks, Larry. This discussion has been fascinating to just kind of listen to, and it's 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 made me think of a couple of things. And I and I think one point that I think needs to be needs to be made. I'm in favor of all the flexibility, on one side. And, and, and providing that maximum ability to folks. But I've also got my, my auditor hat on, and I'm trying to think about, you know, how do we ring fence this and, and what's going to happen over time? And while I agree that there are some similarities in this estimate to other estimates that we deal with today, um, I do think that there are some very distinct differences. For example, with fair value, one might say is one of the most challenging, we have a market participant anchor. Here, I think, we sort of have a management expectation anchor, which I think is fundamentally different from what we have all dealt with in the past. And so while I would generally say that when the FASB puts out a great standard, we don't need new audit standards specific to those accounting standards, I do think this might be one of the instances in which, and I realize this isn't a FASB, question, but I think it needs to be stated. This might be one of those times where we need an audit guidance that is specific to a, an accounting standard, because it's a little bit different from what we've dealt with in the past. And I would think that through that process, it might be helpful to have the audit standards and the accounting standard setters kind of meet together and make sure that what the accounting folks are envisioning is consistent with what's going to be expected from an audit front, because I do think that's going to be a, a key challenge here. I, I don't necessarily want to veer off into the audit, because that's not the point of this discussion, but I think we can't ignore that, and I think it's just important that we acknowledge that, and at some point along the line, I think that would need to be addressed. Well, I noticed Barbara taking notes there, so. 
<laughs> in red. Okay. It's very helpful. Wes? This is Doug. I think, you know, I, in reading and reviewing the language again, I, I think the language beyond the entity shall revert to historical loss information is helpful information uh, in terms of, you know, particularly smaller institutions who are trying to, to grab their, you know, get their arms around what do they do past the reasonable and supportable period. I think though, that information is helpful in clarifying what you know, they should be doing. Again, I would reinforce what everyone else is saying, though. Um, let's not make the language so prescriptive that it becomes, you know, what everyone has to do. So, again, I, I go back to the language that the shall revert language, and that makes it sound, or shall reflect, and that makes it sound very prescriptive. And so, you know, from my perspective, I think if staff could make a rel relatively minor tweaks to the language, I think, you know, staff could create a balance that gives enough information for people to be able to work with regardless of the size or complexity of the institution without, you know, making it prescriptive so everyone looks to this is what has to be done. Okay. Thank you. Wes? Yeah. It Maybe to to just comment on the the audit point. I guess I I, I think about um, management's expectation as being the objective. I think that's uh, a very workable objective, um, and and that's I, I guess I go back to my sub one and two point. That's why we have procedural guidance to evaluate the quality of management's process that that they applied in expressing their judgment uh, or their expectation within the estimate. I, I think it starts in the first instance with management's process. The audit is simply an audit of testing through management's process and evaluating uh, whether it uh, consistently achieved that objective, considering uh, whether or not there was additional information that um, should have been evaluated. But I. I think of it in the first instance as being something that we deal with today, um, and exactly the the the, um, the role of SEB 102 to address your uh, that that specific concern. I guess, Bob. Yeah, I mean, it's been 14 years since I audited, but <clears throat> I would agree with that, and I I would have been, I guess, I personally um, don't quite understand why existing guidance on auditing estimates supplemented by whatever the PCLB decides to do wouldn't be enough, but that's my personal opinion and it's also out of my territory. So Barbara? I'll just make a few comments because I mean I think this has been a really good discussion. You know, I fully appreciate why you added this um, and the, the very tough ta challenges in how to draft something like this. I, I think you've really gotten some good suggestions on how to, how to make this more workable. Uh, I guess one of the things that I'm not sure I'm clear on is so it's fine to have practical exper expedients, but is the intention meant that you would move in and out of this expedient? So maybe today it's not reasonable and supportable given the economic cycle, but maybe in a year or two it is. And I don't know if that was the intention. Um, I'd also caution, right, so I, I know that one of the concerns that, that we would have and then I would, in general I imagine auditors would have is that people aren't abusing the practical expedient yeah. when the information is available. And so maybe one of the suggestions is, is it's not necessarily driven by the size of the entity. I think I've heard some of the community banks talk about having this intimate knowledge of their loan book such that they would be able to do this. So it's not just a size <laughs> issue. Uh, but maybe just focusing on, on that you have to use the information that's readily available. I, I think that that is what the example is getting to. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. Um, I also think the practical expedient, um, you could fall in and out of it depending upon what the circumstances are. But so, <clears throat> Tom, did you? I'm sorry. I think all we've been trying to say or do is this if we leave it alone you'd have to revert back to whatever historical period you had in your data bar none in the practical expedient 
I think what I'm hearing is it's be useful to have some flexibility if you can rationally justify that what reverting back to an isolated short period that's not representative of the forecast, if you can rationally justify it, you can revert back to a different historical piece of information. And having the flexibility to do that would be useful if it can be justified. Mario? I just wanted to address the audit point that was brought up. And Wes addressed it, um, but just along the same lines, I, I don't believe there's as big a divide between a market participant's view and management's view when you're talking about the inputs that are used to develop the estimates. I think they're the same inputs, whether we're talking about expected losses or the other inputs that are used to develop expected cash flows. The difference between the market participant's view that derives fair value for MSR alone or debt security relates to what we discount those cash flows at, not the determination of the cash flows. So in terms of whether or not less is more, I don't think we need to have as much prescriptive guidance on, on that. Okay, thank you. Mark? I want to react on a couple of points. I mean, one, I do think that a new responsibility for this for auditors that we will have to deal with will be um, that we are auditing whether uh, the entity could have reasonably uh, uh, forecasted for a particular period, right? So I think we'll have to talk about how to deal with that, but I think that is going to be a responsibility if that addresses um, uh, Barbara's comment. Uh, and then, I, you know, I've, I've spoken up a couple of times in this paragraph. I want to try and make this sort of my last word on 30-9 on is ultimately the concern is if we say that the historical period has to be reasonably justified, then we're going to come in and say, okay, well, that reasonable justification has to be supported. And so now when you started the paragraph and saying uh, you don't have to prepare a reasonable and supportable forecast, this sort of come full circle, right, where somebody said first, well, it has to be reasonable, and then somebody else is going to come in and say, well, then it has to be supported. And so then you really have no practical expedient at all. It's really sort of come unraveled. So that's ultimately the concern is if we're going to have a practical expedient, we shouldn't have a requirement to – have a reason, have reasonable support for the period that's chosen, or else you're really untangling the entire expedient itself. I think that's a similar point to what Jim Kroger was making. So, okay. I apologize for then Jim for being redundant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard it from Jim. So, <laughs> um, so I think we beat this one to death. Um, <clears throat> I think there's. Quite frankly, I, I think everybody is in reasonable harmony around what we're trying to do. It's just getting the words down on a piece of paper. So the staff is going to um, take out their pens and see if we can work on the words, but I think we all are, are in reasonable agreement. So. so I'd like to move off of paragraph 9 and see if there's any other concerns that people had. Bob? I'll move to a different paragraph. Uh, and it's sort of the interaction <clears throat> between your question 2D and the wording in paragraph uh, 326 7 um, the, the latter question in 2D talks about external information should not be utilized if it is not relevant, or the key I guess I'd focus in on is, or less relevant than the entities own internal information, but paragraph 7, about halfway through, says an entity shall consider available relevant internal information and external information. Well, I guess I'm confused that if some external information is relevant, shouldn't you be considering it and not ignoring it? I think some earlier drafts talked, or maybe even the tentative decisions document talked about not ignoring relevant external information. It may not be as important, but if it's relevant, it would seem like it shouldn't be ignored. And the question sort of implies that you can ignore relevant external information. And that takes me to the last sentence of that paragraph 7. Um, it, I think it would be helpful to indicate that there that the external information, even if it isn't quite as relevant, still should not be ignored if, in fact, it is relevant. Okay. Did you go ahead. I think the intent of the words relevant internal and external information there is to say if there's relevant information, you should consider it. 
if it's irrelevant, obviously you do not. But if it's relevant, you should consider it. That doesn't mean that you consider all forms of information equally. Um, I think that's the intent of the wording. Yeah, I was just concerned. The question seemed to suggest you could ignore, because it no. says should not utilize if it is less relevant. No, it says it's not re or less relevant. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we. I think I had the same question. Is you ha you're going to have a degrees of relevancy, and at what point can you say, well, if it, it's less relevant, so I'm going to ignore it? It, that seems to be what the question would imply. I don't think that's what the standard says is drafted. Okay. Go ahead. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Diane? Larry, thanks. Um, I'm hoping I can give the banks a little bit of a break here and talk about an insurance topic. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd like to, again, thank the board and staff for all the outreach that they've done in this project, especially getting to us insurance companies and asking us about uh, things like the impact it could have on our investment portfolio, uh, but most importantly, the impact it could have on our reinsurance receivables. Reinsurance receivables is it goes to the core of what we do as an insurance industry, um, and so it's extremely important to us. Although... We very much appreciate the fact that the staff and the board have placed example 17, which is at the end of the document. Um, we don't think that it's robust enough and believe that it will likely result in a significant amount of diversity within the insurance industry. Uh, and so as a result, we really would recommend that it, it be further enhanced. There's three areas that we would focus on. Um, the first is the fact that, as already mentioned in example 17, there are several risks associated with reinsurance receivables. One of them is the credit risk of the reinsurer. There are also dispute risks. There's administration, allocation issues, billing issues. What the standard was intended to do, though, was to address the reinsurance uh, credit risk of the reinsurer not the other two risks. And it doesn't state that right now in the example, so that really needs to be clarified. The other risks that we're talking about, the dispute risk with between the reinsurer, the insurance company, um, the uh, billing risk, those would be covered under topic 450. So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that um, historically, the insurance industry has primarily monitored re reinsurance receivables on an individual basis, and that's because many of the contracts are very customized. Um, they're very complex. Uh, we reinsure with very large companies many times that where there's a lot of financial inf information that is out there. Um, and we believe that that really needs to be retained. Um, and we're, we think the examples need to be further enhanced to allow that um, to replace the individual assessment with something that's more of a pooled, simplified methodology just wouldn't be an improvement to what we do today. Um, so in uh, the middle of February, we had provided some input and had provided some examples to the, the staff of situations where an in insurance company may determine that an individual assessment is appropriate versus a pooled assessment, and we think that those should be um, considered for inclusion in, in the standard because it will help us in as an insurance industry to better understand um, when we can apply an individual assessment versus a pooled assessment, and it'll help with the diversity in practice. Because we do think in many cases we will end up with an individual assessment. So, so we're hoping that you'll go back to the examples that we had provided and consider placing some of those within the actual example. And it could all probably be included in example 17. Okay. The last aspect of it, which um, is even more critical, is the fact that in many cases, we likely will end up with an individual assessment for our reinsurance contracts. Um, I, I'm, I'd like to just share a quick example and, and see if this is aligned with what you were thinking with the standard. Um, for example, an insurance company may write insurance in a particular state. In order to write insurance in that particular state, you're required to provide unlimited personal 
injury protection to the insureds. The way that, and, and doesn't that sound awfully risky, right? <laughs> so, so the way that the program is set up by the state is that there is an association or a reinsurance mechanism that's created and it creates a threshold. The threshold says if there's a claim that's lower than that threshold, the insurance company pays for it. If there's a claim that's greater than that threshold, the insurance company can cede it to this association. And then you look at the association and you say, well, how's the association going to pay those excess claims that are coming about? Well, the association pays the claims because it is assessing all those insurance companies that write business in that particular state. And those assessment, assessments can be modified and adjusted periodically. The result is that the assessments that are coming in as income for that association are then used to pay the claims um, of you know, any claims above the thresholds that the insurance companies have. It pays for operating expenses of the reinsurance mechanism or the association. Um, and so when you step back and think about it, boy, doesn't that sound like a very customized and unique reinsurance program? Great. So we would likely look at it and say, that's an individual assessment of that reinsurance receivable. When we look at it individually then, and this is the key, is that we would look at it and say, this is a single purpose entity. The purpose of this association that's paying us on these reinsurance receivables is to collect money through the assessments and to pay the claims. This is a state-run sort of mechanism. It, it goes to you know being sort of government-sponsored. If we look at historical losses, they've been zero. If we think about current conditions and future, you know, reasonable and supportable forecasts, we would say it's going to be zero. So we put up a zero loss allowance for that particular situation. And we think that that would end up being the situation with other reinsurance contracts because as I mentioned earlier, we've got very, very large, you know, reinsurers who um, are regulated by the insurance regulators. They're required to have, you know, minimum capital requirements. The contracts have all of these backstops to prevent defaults from occurring. And again, if you look historically at them, well, first of all, they're all customized, so we look at them individually. Then if you look historically at them, you would see there have been no losses. And when you think about it going forward, you would say there are not going to be any losses, and we'd end up with a zero credit loss allowance. So that's the way we saw the standard applying to reinsurance receivables, and we wanted to confirm that that really is what the um, you know intent is. Did we interpret it appropriately? And if so, we really think it should, you know some of these examples should be added to example 17 again to try to reduce the possibility of diversity in practice. Okay, so let us review with the staffs what some of those examples are, and then we'll. I just, um, just a, I think we had a couple of comments that sure. yeah. get Diane's feedback on. One thing I, I'd just like to highlight is that, you know, from our discussion, we've, um, you know, the, the other risks that are not credit related, we've clarified that in the industry guidance with within the amendments to this codification. Oh, so okay. they wouldn't be, you they're not, you Great. just don't have that as Great. part of this material. Good job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, as part of um, the collective versus individual assessments, I think our intent on the staff and as I understand the board's decision is that there would be flexibility and if you truly intend and if you truly believe that there is no similarity between others it would be evaluated individually and common risk characteristics yeah yeah exactly and so an individual assessment would not be prohibited in the situations where there's a truly unique scenario as you described and, and additionally uh, the board didn't draw bright lines in terms of when a zero loss would be appropriate. We we have an example of a U.S. Treasury security, uh, and we highlight that uh, based on historical information as well as qualitative considerations of reasonable and supportable forecasts, we expect a zero loss. So um, while you do need to consider the risk of loss, even if it's remote, there's no rule that you can never have a zero risk of loss. So um, to add on to Jack's point, Diane, we, we really appreciated your help and your staff's help with the examples that you gave us. And we looked at those examples. And the intent of example 17 was to try and, and take those examples and almost give you um, a little bit more of a framework 
to think about in terms of your ind individual assessment and give you the factors that you had listed and you had just described an example. Because uh, we were worried that if we just gave an example, then everyone would just focus on that one example while in fact you have many, many fact patterns you have to think through. So we, we were intending the framework to be more powerful for you to use to then figure out whether or not should something be individually assessed or collectively assessed. And th that was, so that was the intent of our summarizing it. Okay. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for the background. Um, that's that's certainly helpful. And I think Larry um, had mentioned that you know we'd be uh, open and would love to continue to work with you on it as you as you further develop example seventeen, if that's your plan. Sure. Um, great. And 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 I I really also just just wanted to get a reaction, um, you know, from the accounting firms who are here in, in that, um, you know. The example that I laid out, I, I think you clearly get to this zero, you know, credit loss allowance, and I, I'm just curious, was was that a pretty strong argument? <laughs> <laughs> Not putting you on the spot or anything. <laughs> Especially Deloitte, can you comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, <laughs> I, I've used that very similar thought process in numerous meetings internally about if you're in an individual assessment, so that's a question, but if you are, and the standard says start with history, history zero, next step forecast, let's say your reasonable forecast is zero, any reversion methodology from zero to zero <laughs> seems like zero. So, And the banking regulators don't have to worry about it. But the standard Business also insurance. says consider <laughs> internal and relevant internal and external information. And so reference to potentially understanding portfolio risk characteristics of, of things that are similar, even if it's not internal, I think the standard does ask you to consider. Yeah, that. no, I, my, my only point being if you had 50 years of history that was zero right. and you were saying, well, what is my forecast over the foreseeable future? And, and, and it reasonably wasn't different from 50 years of history. Right. I don't think you would need just personally to model a, a forecast that differs from 50 years of history if there weren't factors to tell you to do that. And they're state regulated. Yeah, the cetera. thing. I mean, I, I think all of that would go into your consideration of what the credit risk is associated with those receivables, which I would imagine are, fa I don't know, fairly short term. Uh, the receivables? Uh, they, they, they're it's fairly short. Some some of them are very short term. Excluding so, the dispute, some go out. Excluding yeah. the dispute risk. Some go out a little bit. Okay. I wanted to respond, Tom, though, to to your comment real quick about about considering external information. The point, though, is that these are so customized. There is no external information to compare to. That depends on facts and circumstances. Yeah. No, I, I, I understand what you're saying. So what I'm hearing you is asking a request that if it's individually evaluated because there's not similar risk characteristics, it's always zero. No. I don't think the standard says that. No. Yeah, no, no, no. that's, no, that's, not, that's not what I'm asking. Right. Very unique fact pattern to, to very unique industry that we probably shouldn't expand beyond that particular that's, that, And that's what I was trying to prevent. I think mm -hmm. in many instances, there are even in the bank regulation circumstances, when you get to an individual valuation, it's still thought to be at least considering relevant external portfolio information. Jeff? Yeah, when you were talking about that, well, I heard a lot of AIGs um, among my neighbors here. I guess. But um, I, I just wanted to point out I think you have to be careful in just looking at a history of zero for a long period of time. It's not always zero. Um, you know, what I'm thinking about is the, the I.O. loans that, that were developed in California for a long period of time when housing prices appreciated for many decades in a row. There were no losses on those loans, and then there were huge losses on those loans during the crisis. So I, I think underwriting changed a lot, too, um, sure. you know, during that time period. but. I just want to caution against just just because you have a long history of zero. I think you still have to think about whether that you just can't automatically go to zero. Agreed. Yeah, Jeff, I I agree with that. I mean, they, I didn't say that in what I was presenting, but the point is that we would be looking at you know current conditions. What's really changed? Have we has the association you know made some sort of decisions that could have an impact on this? Um, you know, have we done anything differently? So. I was just speaking for my banks. I don't want to get any ideas from you. 
<laughs> I'm happy to work with those banks. <laughs> Dan? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the U.S. Treasury example, uh, and I know there's been discussion on this in the past that uh, was included in, in the materials. I know some folks have concerns that, uh, you know, that example is kind of the, the gold standard and there's certain criteria that are outlined in that example, and does that set kind of a minimum level of criteria when thinking about debt securities and, you know, sovereign debt securities, for example, on what you need to meet to be able to conclude uh, that there's zero credit loss. Uh, and, you know, just hearing the discussion, I don't think that that's the only example that could be out there. I don't think that was necessarily the, the board's intent. Uh, and so I think the language there is helpful. It's, you know, this is one way to look at it or it's an example. Um, but, but there is a way over time where examples kind of set minimum thresholds. And so maybe continue to work with that language to soften it a bit more to say that, you know, this is, um, you know, it's illustrative. It's, it's not the only way to look at it. Um, and you don't have to have kind of all, all these factors to be able to reach this conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Any other issues? Tim? Uh, Kevin? Uh, this is uh, Doug Wright. If we can move to a different paragraph. Uh, Doug, Doug can, can you just wait one second? I, somebody else is speaking. Sure. Kevin? Okay. Yeah, the, the paragraph oh, sorry. I thought it was on. Do we, do we really need a practical expedient here? Because I think phase 114 has a practical expedient because DCF was required. So this came in as a practical expedient to that requirement of DCF. But early on, whatever the paragraph is, 2030-3 says you could use various methods. Wouldn't this just be a, just another various method that you could use and you don't have to identify it as a practical expedient? Just, Bob? You're right. I think the, from a banking agency standpoint, practical expedient is basically the requirement. And I think uh, what this, as I read the practical expedient, it's making it simple and straightforward. You're just taking today's fair value, and you're not even considering a reasonable and supportable forecast in this narrow situation. So it's sort of continuing what's the current practice under 114, whereas if you're using collateral in other situations, I think forget which paragraph it is, but it's where it's talking about the risk of loss and ha not having zero as the answer, whereas under the practical expedient you could. There you have to, in that paragraph, you had to consider some forecast and the likely movement of the values of collateral and how they've changed over time. And here, what makes it a practical expedient is you're just going to today's value and you're done, basically. So I think that's and common practice. Where he's right. And bar's impaired, right? right? It's an impaired loan, although it doesn't use the <laughs> word impaired. Yeah. So I think no, I, I, that's I, I understand that, but I, and, you, and you just mentioned require because you all do require it, whereas this says may, right? But you guys require it, and so I guess my question is: is why does it have to be required? Why can't a DCF be used, for example, versus this thing? If it's if DCF gives you a potentially better answer, is, is a better estimate? I think that's something that agencies would have to talk about. I mean, I think the long-standing supervisory practice is to to look to the fair value, is ultimately that's the. The, the backstop if it's, in fact, a collateral-dependent situation. But I think, uh, it is a practical I think under expedient. CECL, you could. Kevin, to right, your point, You could I think, do both yeah. because it's a practical expedient. Maybe under our rules it, it, it wouldn't be allowed. But I think, to me, what makes it a practical expedient are two things that Bob pointed out. One, it's you don't have to consider future. And secondly, it, 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 it applies when the borrower is in an impaired condition. The borrower is having financial difficulty. So that that's what, to me, makes it not just part of regular CECL. Mark? Uh, just on paragraph 326.20-30-5, uh, um, I think the, the board had uh, a lot of uh, detailed discussion on premiums and discounts. 
and how those should be treated, including how um, you know a loss rate might be applied uh, when you have a premium or discount. And and what I took away was, you know, under the board's view, there was going to be a, a little bit of complexity there associated with premiums and discounts. That if a company had traditionally calculated its loss rates using the unpaid principal balance, that they were either going to have to do a study of how premiums and discounts uh, have historically impacted the charge-off amounts, or otherwise estimate the typical amount of time that passes uh, from origination to charge-off to sort of figure out how much of premiums and uh, discounts typically amortize uh, to figure out how to impact the allowance amount. Those are some of the things like I heard in the, in the board discussion. Um, not a lot of that detail ended up getting put into 30-5. Um, it's very it's very high level. Again, maybe less is more. Uh, but I did want to point out that if you know if the board wanted maybe more consistent application of some of those very specific discussions on this area, that you might want to think about either enhancing 30-5 or providing an example that might illustrate how a lost rate approach might be uh, applied in a situation where there was a premium or a discount. <coughs> Okay, we'll think about it. I mean, I, I think what we discussed is generally referred to in 30-5. Um, I guess my own immediate reaction without thinking about it for long would be that we're not prescribing specific methods of doing the allowance at all. And therefore, to try to give more prescriptive either guidance or examples on this what I consider small aspect of the allowance would be going above and beyond and, con and contrary to the way we're creating the model to begin with. So, but w we'll think about it. Yeah, and I would agree with you. There's no, that there's nothing in 30-5 that is inconsistent in my mind with okay. you know with with what was decided. Okay, John. Well, I, we were just talking about collateral dependent financial assets and I was wondering why the definition in the glossary changed and that it included in whether something's collateral dependent now we just say um, that the entity has to be experiencing financial difficulty first and there could be non-recourse loans that are just backed by commercial property or you would say that's collateral dependent the only means of actually collecting under the loan is whether the property is kicking off the cash to support the loan, but somehow now in the glossary we're saying you've already got the borrower has to be experiencing financial difficulty, and we've also added the word substantially in there. Well, I think it, in looking at the definition, I think it is a definition that exists for an expedient. So we wanted to make sure that there was financial deterioration, and that you that the that the creditor did in fact believe that it was going to be substantially repaid from the collateral. We didn't want this collateral dependent expedient to be applied to any collateralized product what, what, regardless, regardless of whether there's been any deterioration. And also we didn't want this to be applied in situations where the collateral was irrelevant to the collectability of the loan. We wanted it to be limited to those situations where there is difficulty and we expect to be repaid from that collateral. So if I have a non-recourse loan, yeah. okay, <clears throat> but I'm paying it and I continue to pay it, regardless of the fact that the fair value of the collateral has gone down below, you know, we don't want that to be um, applied to, in this situation. Understood, but to me that doesn't seem like you're defining a collateral dependent financial asset. You're just saying when you can apply a practical expedient. And sometimes you put up a, a trust that has property in it and is funded by debt. And I would think that you could look, in fact, that is a collateral dependent financial asset. There are no, no other cash flows are coming in and out of that trust. And whether they're experiencing financial gift difficulty or not doesn't to me, define whether the asset's collateral dependent. Now, you could work that into the scoping of when you want to allow a practical expedient, but also, I thought we were allowing a lot of flexibility in different approaches. And in fact, if you're coming up with the value of that, you might do a DCF on the property to come up with the fair value of the property. That likely is how you're going to value a commercial property is doing a DCF. I, I think, John, we were trying to the collateral dependent financial asset term was very specific for certain scenarios. 
Because if it's not, and you just apply it to anything that's collateral based, I think banks would get to a zero loss on day one automatically when their LTV reflects that. And, and I don't think anyone had supported that notion. So that's why we were very specific in the way we worded it and how we applied it in the subs subsequent measurement guidance. But John, I've been complaining throughout that this label is it very pertains to very specific facts. Mm -hmm. But you read it independently, it seems like it's broader. And that's what I think you're raising. And John, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's that you wouldn't consider the value of collateral in other fact patterns. You, you would, but you can't blindly rely on the value of the collateral in other fact patterns. And I think we're saying this expedient, when you're in it, allows you to not even think about right. future changes or DCF or anything else. It allows you to blindly, look, and to your point, the definition could, you know, there's a lot of things that are collateral dependent. This is a subset of collateral dependent loans for which you can solely look to the underlying. Then are you guys okay with substantially? Because it seems like you've backed off a little and said it's substantially through the operation or sale. <coughs> we'll think about that. Bob? I think the wording today is solely dependent on, I think, and that's led to questions, and maybe the same question arises with substantially, yeah, but I mean, right. substantially, I think I'd be comfortable with that. And, and if you look back to 326.2030-10, it gets to the point, I think, uh, Tom or someone was making that you can't just blindly go to the collateral value, even if, even if you had a collateral dependent non-recourse loan as you were talking about, if historically looking at those types of loans, you'd have experience where there, even though maybe there's a good loan to value today, in a cycle or a particular property has problems, you would have loss experience for financial assets secured with similar collateral. So that's how you would get to not supporting a zero allowance just because today you've got some margin of protection from the collateral value. I think you achieve that in 35-4 by saying the collateral dependent financial asset has to be experiencing financial difficulty. And maybe, it, maybe it's just semantics, but it seems like you can have the way you're defining the collateral dependent financial assets and then 35-4 saying that again. We're already trying to scope the practical expedient to maybe only those where the financial difficulty is occurring, which is getting rid of maybe your concerns of zero on day one or, but it seems like, I don't know, maybe it's just the semantics of the definition of collateral dependent financial asset. We're trying to fit the scope of it into the definition and the scope of when you can do the expedient in 35-4, which I don't have a problem if you want to limit when you can do that, but it seems like defining it as something where the ex borrower is experiencing difficulty doesn't match up for me as, as how you define what a collateral dependent financial asset is. That's all. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue zero uh, day one losses. I was already tried to. So, John, are you saying we have a marketing issue in terms of how we called it? No, no. I think what he's I think what he's saying is you can have a collateral dependent financial uh, instrument, and what we should do it is is in the scope paragraph we should have we should define collateral dependent financial instruments as X, and then in the scope paragraph we should have a collateral dependent financial that is having financial difficulties. That's the scope, and I think what you're concerned about is is by doing that within the definition we're going to confuse people that aren't in the scope of the practical expedient. I, I guess just one observation. Do we need to, I mean, the way 35-4 has been written, I don't think you need to have a defined term, collateral dependent financial asset. Isn't this the only time it's used or referred to in the standard? It is. It is. So I, I, I understand because I think of, any, most people think collateral dependent. Well, there's a lot of collateral dependent, but it, you know, it's that terminology. I almost think you could get rid of that terminology. Okay and we'll just use the wording that's in 35-4. Right. We, we, will, we, will we will consider that. Jeff, did you have an extra point? And so just one last point on collateral dependent. Um, when we were reading uh, example six on page 36, which was the collateral dependent, to me that read like foreclosure was probable. And so it may be obvious to others, but we would I think we would expect that you would have to use the fair value of collateral when foreclosure was probable. Just wanted to clarify, like, like today. Okay. Dan? Oh, I keep forgetting. Dan, can I put you on hold for a second? Doug, I'm sorry. I never got back to you. Certainly. Uh, I would like to, if we can, shift to, I guess, uh, the examples and uh, some challenges that I'd like to present to the group, for the, particularly for the first example. 
which is 326 2055-20 through 22. And, you know, first I'd like to compliment the staff and the board for including a historical loss rate example. I think that will give comfort to a lot of smaller financial institutions because that's the method that they're currently using. So, you know, I think that's really helpful. I think the language and the example used uh, may have some challenges or may, uh, there may be room for improvement. Um, and the first thing I'd like to highlight is in 3 uh, in the dash, in 55-20, the use of the word cumulative, I think presents a danger um, because I think there's a danger and this has been highlighted in some of the industry discussions and even with an FRB presentation, I think there's a danger that some institutions may look at that and basically take you know, a 10-year loss rate and accumulate that over, you know, take each average annual loss rate and accumulate that over 10 years and come up with their allowance based on that. And that completely ignores, you know, the life, the life of the asset. And so without considering or at least interjecting something around the life of the asset, I think there's a danger of, of an oversimplification that results in a reserve rate that's probably not, or a historical loss rate that's probably not really reflective of, of what should be in there. So I consider, or I would suggest that we consider the language in that particular paragraph. In paragraph 22, um, which lays out the results of the historical loss rate analysis, again, I think we're ignoring uh, the economic life of the asset, and by ignoring the economic life of the asset, you ignore the impact of the reversion to the mean. Uh, so if you just take the 1.5% and add the 15 basis points to it, uh, basically that gets you to what is in the example, 165. But if you do any particular modeling where you have different assets with different lives, what happens with that is that for those assets that ultimately do revert to the mean, whether the mean is higher or lower, you come up with a different number than that 165 that's in the example. And so I think those two examples, while I think are helpful in trying to, first of all, you know, rationalize and, and allow for a historical loss rate approach, are simplified to the point where I think they may direct financial institutions in a manner that that results in an allowance that is different than when you actually model what should probably happen in that respect. So what I'd like to, I guess, is throw it out to the committee to see if they have the same reaction or if there are some suggestions for how we can continue to maintain the historical loss rate approach as a, as a good example and a relevant example for a lot of institutions. but but to provide more guidance on you know, how it really should be implemented. So I think I can make a couple of comments in terms of what we were trying to intend to do with the example, in that the um, 150, 1.50 uh, historical loss rate is the historical loss rate for the entire life of the portfolio. And so this particular bank in this example, the historical period showed $150 of losses. And based on the current conditions and forecast, that bank thought they were going to lose 15 more dollars compared to the 150. So it was an incremental to the historical lifetime loss rate. When you think about it in that context, if it's incremental to the entire lifetime rate and it's an immediate reversion, at that point it's just a direct add-on to the 150. Because they don't think they're losing 150, they think they're losing 165. And so we could probably be more clear in terms of how that immediate reversion had worked within the example. Because I think also it's not a straight line approach. I think in the, in the prior giraffe we made it a little bit more complicated. And, and that's what we were intending to do with this example. No, not necessarily. It's, it's in, the $15 may not be lost in the first year or the second year. It's lost incrementally to the 150 it's, it's, it's incremental to the aggregate 150. So we're not specifying here the exact timing. We're just saying, look at the loss rate in its entirety. How am I changing the loss rate in its entirety? And through an immediate reversion in that context, and then it's just a direct adjustment to the loss rate. I, I, so. think, I think Doug does bring up a good point in that 
we use this term cumulative historical lifetime credit loss rate and that's a term that not everybody may be familiar with and, and I got some responses from clients who had read this and based kind of on how closely maybe they'd followed this project they got different ideas of what that might be so uh, to me the key is when we say that what are we talking about I I personally didn't think it was an entity saying for each of the past 10 years I've lost 15 basis points multiply that by 10 my loss rates 150 basis points I didn't think that was appropriate and that's part of my my kind of trying to understand what's the ring fence what 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 are even though we pro are trying to provide maximum flexibility we do need to kind of have a feel for what what what's out of bounds and what's in bounds yeah no I, I agree and I, I I think the staff has thought about perhaps some drafting around this example because I was confused by it and I think we discussed it for 45 minutes in my office so I thought Doug had a good idea I don't he's asking the question do we really need the word cumulative yeah, no, I, 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 agree. I agree. I don't think we do. Yeah, we, because we it feels like it's a buildup of annual. This, and we've got to get people stop thinking about yes. it a buildup of annual, including the top off. It's not a two year top off, it's a, it's a buildup of the lifetime adjustment. Totally agree. Okay, Bob. I was just going to add that uh, the way this model is constructed and the way Matt was describing it, there really isn't a, a reversion in effect, it's sort of built into the model. And maybe that goes back to the earlier paragraph that talks about reversion if necessary. G given here, it doesn't seem like it's necessary because the extra 15 basis points or whatever it is is kind of over the whole life, it seems like, even though it's only based on a forecast out over two years. I mean, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking in the context that to me that meant an immediate reversion. Um, but th that was just my own point of view. And maybe immediate reversion means different things to different people. Okay. Tim? Yeah, I, I agree, Matt. That's, that's the way, a straightforward way you look at it. And I, don't, I didn't understand the comment about there are different periods of time because it, it starts off, this is, ten, these are ten, these are home, this is a homogeneous group of loans. It's 10-year amortizing loans, and that way we're looking at the historical loss experience on those, on that same period of time that those loans apply to. So um, when the gentleman said that uh, there was confusion because of different uh, lengths of time, I didn't understand that point. So maybe we could clarify that because it it seemed consistent the the, re the whole way through the example to me, and it it was it was right on in terms of how you would approach a situation like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Dan, did you want to go? Yeah, I was going to go back to collateral dependence. So is go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Tim, I, I think I can explain the, the, con the confusion is, and it has to do with the history of the project. What some people have said is that when we're looking for a 10-year um, loss rate, some people thought what you did is you, and this is not at all what we ever intended, but people thought that you took a one-year loss rate and multiplied it by 10, and that obviously would grossly inflate. And so that's the sensitivity of we want to make sure, and kind of what Robert was talking about, we want to make sure that when we articulate this, we don't give anybody the impression that you do the latter. It's, it's, what, it's what we're all talking about here. That, that's what we want to make sure. Okay. It sounds like uh, you know staff is is very clear on what the objective is, and I think we're all probably it sounds like all in agreement on what the objective is. So it sounds like we can probably resolve that with maybe additional drafting or or looking at uh, you know more clarification in the example. The other point uh, that I would like to suggest is that if you could, I think it would be helpful if you could take that same example and apply a year two. Uh, create a new example that's year two, um, I, because I think there's a lot of confusion in the industry about, okay, we've got our first day implementation of the new standard. We've come up with our first day allowance. Now we're going down another quarter or another year. How do we adjust that or modify that to reflect you know, new estimates and changes in the estimates that we came with? So I think it would be helpful if, if there's some consideration to providing an additional example, building off that same example for a passage of time. Doug, um, it's Matt speaking. We can, we can consider that further. The only concern I have is the more examples we put in, 
I, th I feel like the more we box people into doing certain things, and I worry that I would limit flexibility among the institutions. Right. Okay, Dan. All right, great. Yeah, just wanted to make uh, a couple comments on uh, <clears throat> this is the, I guess, the practical expedient where you have a financial asset secured by collateral maintenance provisions. Um, and I think this works extremely well for, um, you know, traditional uh, secured lending like re reverse repo transactions and securities lending transactions. Most reverse repos where we lend out $100 cash, you know, we get $102 of securities in. And the purpose of that transaction is really to provide financing for the owner of the Treasury securities uh, that come in. And so, you know, with the daily mark to market and the adjustment of the collateral, we meet all the conditions there, and we have collateral that's equal to generally in excess of the amount that we've lent. So it works extremely well. Uh, in uh, other securities lending type transactions where we do borrow versus cash and we're bringing in equity securities, and these are very material activities as well, the purpose of those transactions typically are to deliver against a short. And so when we give $100 out, we'll get $98 of equity securities of collateral that comes in. And so technically, you know, we're not going to meet having collateral equal to or exceeding the amount that we've lent. But I think, you know, uh, the way I read the language, uh, in, in that case, we don't have to automatically reserve $2 for the shortfall of the collateral. Because you just have to consider it. You have to consider it. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, you would limit limit the measurement of the allowance to kind of that shortfall. You don't measure it to the for shortfall, but it's, yeah. So I, um, yeah, I think this, you know, so for a price 60, 70 percent of all the very material, you know, uh, reverse repo type transactions we have, this works beautifully for others, do a little bit more work, but still I think the model, uh, so I don't think we need to change anything here the way I'm reading. I think it works very well, but it's, you know, it doesn't cover the whole population Sure. Uh, perfectly. There's a little more analysis there. So. Okay. Robert? I want to go back to example one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and just it's more of a, a, a clarification um, in, in how this works in this example. Um, it seems as though we're talking about an open pool, meaning I've got loans, my, my amortized cost balance at the end of the period is $3 million. Some of those loans were originated five years ago, three years ago, ten years, so they've got varying remaining term to maturity that I am applying a single 10-year loss rate to. Is that right? Okay. Just trying to make sure I understand it. Okay. So I'm trying to evaluate whether we need a break or whether we need to come up with the final question. So do you all have any other issues? Him? I do. I, I, you gave a break, but all I want to do is circle back and actually clean up the agenda, which is should we just let it stay through the softball questions and start nodding your head. But I'd like to just get some positive assurance that, like, my sense is that the answer to those questions generally is yes. I think it's clear. I think you did a great job in terms of indicating the flexibility and things like that. But that's me, and I would be very interested. Well, I'm trying to evaluate what everybody else thinks because I know what I think. I'm trying to evaluate whether we need a break or whether we're done with the meeting. I guess does anybody think the answer is no? Other than what we talked about? Hearing hearing none? Jim. Just to make this last longer, one one question, which <laughs> <laughs> which, which there's a question in there about the about yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks John. Uh, about the usefulness of uh, example two, um, and I don't, I haven't heard, you know. So I think the, the feedback we heard is that, and, and re particularly from, you know, community banks or, or credit unions, there was a lot of discussion about 
doing individual assessments and the examples at individual assessment level, but then I think maybe some feedback after we put this example that this isn't really how a community bank might assess its loans, that they're really not using individual assessment, and some saying perhaps we should delete that example. Is your perspective that it's useful? Absolutely not. It's very useful, and actually, my bank and a lot of the community bankers I know, that's exactly how we do it because we have an eclectic portfolio. You know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is, is these, these gentlemen and ladies that... Actually, uh, t Tim, I'm sorry, can you just get a mic? I just want to make sure everyone can hear you. I, it, it's exactly the way we do it because because of the nature of our portfolios, uh, there it's an eclectic type of thing, and there's so many differences. It doesn't lend itself to pooling because, like in my case, we're selling the loans that are conforming. We're selling into the secondary market. And the, the loans that we have in our portfolio are loans around the community. They're all different kinds of things, different ways, and different kinds of collateral. And we've got parents co-borrowing, pledging, and all that kind of thing. And so um, we often get to the point where we need to look at the individual loan and I think this example is very good in terms of that's how you that's how you look at it and that's how you get to a good answer uh, and it's much better than trying to group loans together that shouldn't be grouped together because they're so different no that that's very helpful exactly what I think I needed to hear and I would agree this is Doug I would agree with that I think the example is very helpful both in terms of how it illustrates the application but also in that just by including that example, it allows for and justifies the use of an individual evaluation. So I, th I think that reinforces the message that an individual uh, loan evaluation is okay within the standards. So I think that's, that's useful to the industry. Okay. Jeff? Sorry to delay, but hopefully this will be quick. I just wanted to make sure that, that the way we were reading the PCD pooling um, paragraph on page 15, 30-13. So the fact that you have to allocate the premium or the non-credit premium or discount to each individual asset, the way that, that we kind of came to the conclusion was that, that the only thing you're pooling is for purposes of the allowance, but you're individually accounting for the loans in terms of interest and, and other other things. Is that, that, that's is that what the intent was? Okay. That was, that was the intent. There's no longer that unit of a one unit of account for a pool right. on the PC. Yeah, okay. Robert? Sorry, Larry, I know you want to get out of here. No, no. I <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I go through the question, I just want to go through and highlight a couple of maybe questions that, that I had on, on some of these questions. So the first one in terms of the flexibility and not requiring one specific approach I think is clear. There was one uh, if on page 15 in paragraph 35-1 the last sentence talks about the method applied to initially measure expected credit losses for PCD assets shall be applied consistently over time. So we had some debate as does that mean that every time I initially measure or purchase some assets I need to use the same method at that initial moment or that and then I can change or did, does that mean that I should whatever I use initially should remain consistent through the life of those loans? because I think there's a possibility that you're going to change, and it mentions elsewhere in here, that you may change, depending on facts and circumstances, your method. Right, and we, we also discussed back in the September meeting that things can evolve in terms of um, preparers' ability to make these estimates, and we don't want to preclude people from going to a better method. So your point, let, let us look at those okay. words. All right. Um, the, the other comment that I'll, I'll raise on, on, on question D, um, we talked a lot about the relevance to the entity, um, and I think we can work through that. There's a new concept that, or a new principle, I think, that we're starting to embed in some of these accounting standards. I think it was in classification measurement, the concept of undue cost and effort. And I can see that being a pressure point, again, and it might be helpful to have some examples on what is undue cost or effort. Um, to kind of help help people understand well where is that line I, I think of um, you know when we say something isn't practicable to do in in the literature we know how to deal with that but this is a slightly new concept that trying to figure out kind of where that is it's not, it's not that no. I, I think it's in fair value it's also in when you apply the retrospective method 
it's also in error corrections. Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath, Bob. Uh, I'm going to bring up an issue. I know <laughs> some of the some of the board members know this is one that the uh, agencies keep harping on. It's the in example ten about the unconditionally cancelable loan commitments on the credit cards, and the decision is that it's not credit exposure. So, not debating that. Uh, Diane mentioned 450. Well, yeah, 450 <laughs> coming in for some other risks, and if this is as it's been described as operational risk, is there any kind of consequential amendment, or we just rely on? Can we rely on 450 to say, well, the operational risk of extending credit because you fail to, or you don't seem like there's a need to exercise the unconditionally cancelable provision, and you've got loss experience showing that it has happened. Is, but, but, is that under 450 then? But what Diane was referring to was a different type of risk. It wasn't a credit risk, okay? It, it, was, it was really um, a dispute risk. That's very different <clears throat> than what you're suggesting. You're suggesting that if this is still credit risk, but you throw it into a different standard. No, I was yeah. suggesting if it's operational risk, because I've heard the description of well, the failure to it's operational time. risk that creates credit risk. Right, but until the funding occurs, is it operational? Risk? Allowance, uh, reserve I, I understand what you're suggesting. That that, that was not our idea. So, we'd have to get into a debate about whether that's a liability at year end because right. it's future operations. It's future operations. Yeah. And, and under 450, do you accrue for future risk? But it, it may be that they didn't cut it off at year ends, but they haven't drawn on it yet. So I don't know if it's. I mean, just if the idea is early recognition of credit losses, then again, that's the decision the board made. It seems like we've got historical experience that show that there's these losses that do occur. Um, should we be establishing an allowance or reserve for it? Yeah, I understand your position. I mean, but to Jim's point, you know, our, our view is that you assess whether it's a liability at year end, and quite frankly, we think it, I personally think it's a liability for something in the future, which is not something that you would accrue for. But that's my e personal even though that Even though entities today have, personal have a reserve for that. Well, but this is a new standard. Jeff. No, I know, but did, was there a decision made to change that, or do you think it was just a misapplication today? Let's let's not comment on that. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have any questions or issues? I don't see any. Okay. I realize that you all made some of you made a long trip for a relatively short meeting, but I think it was very useful. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think we've gotten some, some good suggestions and we're going to take those in, but um, quite frankly, um, you know, we're really appreciative of the time and effort, and I know it, you only had a week to review it, so you didn't have a lot of time, but we're extremely appreciative of it. In terms of um, next steps, um, we're, we're going to go back, the staff's going to go back, and we'll obviously evaluate um, the comments that were made here in terms of uh, further drafting of the document. Um, I believe we're, we're trying to have a meeting sometime towards the end of April, um, uh, at which time the, the staff will go through a summary of the, of the costs and benefits, uh, as we usually do, um, and then also address um, the effective date. While we have made a decision already, um, we realize that the standard has not hit the street um, when we were originally anticipating it would hit the street. So um, individual board members will have to make an assessment as to whether the, the last vote is the final vote or whether we, we change that. And we would do that at that meeting as well. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> you know, from there we'll make a, uh, Russ will ask for a final vote on the standard. Um, and then we'll, we'll proceed with final drafting, and, and our hope is that we issue this standard by June 30th. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, pretty good job. Okay, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it.